I'll be reading today from Matthew 24, verse 45, as we continue our expositional study in the Gospel of Matthew. Again, that's Matthew 24, verse 45. Who then, Jesus says in the Olivet Discourse, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth." Let me start by asking a question. This question is meant for anyone who has had a job where you had to answer to a boss. Here's the question. When that boss was away on vacation or away on business, have we ever treated ourselves to a mini vacation? And here's what I mean. While the boss was away, you did your work, but you took a few liberties. You spent a little bit more time at lunch. Maybe you rolled in a little late in the morning. I think if we're honest, we will confess that most of us have. There's even a saying for this kind of situation. Perhaps you've heard it. When the cat's away, the mice will play. There seems to be something in our hearts, something in our hearts that when those who are placed above us in authority are away, we have a desire to rebel against that authority. And in a sense, put ourselves in charge. While we might confess that we are naturally inclined toward that kind of behavior, we would do well to ask ourselves, is that the right thing to do? We know, of course, the answer to that is no. It is not the right thing to do. If we have a half hour lunch break, while the boss is there, we ought to have a half hour lunch break when the boss is not there. Our behavior should be the same whether the boss is there or not. If we agree that that is a true statement, consider how much more important it is to be upright and consistent as we answer to God. As Jesus continues his teaching in the Olivet Discourse, he now provides a parable that asks this question. During this time, when Christ has gone to the Father's right hand, how will we conduct ourselves while the Master is away? And more specifically, the question is this. Will we be faithful and wise, or will we be wicked and rebellious? Let's look, please, at Matthew 24, verse 45. Who, then, is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Let's go to verse 48, 
where we see the alternative conduct. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. And so the question that Christ puts before us today, the question that each of us must ask ourselves is this, which servant am I? Am I the wise servant or the wicked servant? Before we go any further into the text, let's step back and take a broader view of the context in which this passage appears. When Jesus is speaking these words, it is just days before he will be handed over by the temple leaders to the Romans. He will be crucified and buried in a borrowed tomb. But on the third day, he will rise from the grave just as he said. His apostles and many others will be witnesses to Christ's miraculous victory over death. And his victory confirms the promise that Jesus made when he said that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The book of Acts tells us that after Christ's resurrection, Jesus spent an additional 40 days with his apostles. And then Jesus was taken up into heaven where he was returned to the Father's right hand. And when Jesus was taken up, we can imagine how difficult that was for the disciples. <clears throat> Jesus had just returned from the grave and now, he was leaving them again. And so as he ascended into heaven, they stared into the sky, and as they were looking, the Bible says suddenly two men dressed in white, angels, stood beside them saying, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And so, every Christian who has put their faith in Christ is, as the Apostle Paul declares, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are eager for his return because we know that everyone who has embraced him as Lord and as Savior will be with him forever. But for those who refuse him, who reject his invitation to eternal life, his, will, his return will not be one of joy, but of horror. Because by their rejection, they invite upon themselves the judgment of God. We don't know when Christ will return. Contrary to the arrogant and misguided attempts by some so-called Bible experts. We cannot predict the date of Christ's return. And the Bible is perfectly clear on this matter. Earlier in the Olivet G Discourse, Jesus said this, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. While we do not know the day or hour of his return, the Bible does tell us many important details about his return. 
And one of the most important details about his coming is that his return will be a two-part event. The first part of his return is referred to as the rapture. While the word rapture does not appear in the Bible, it is a word that has been pressed into service to describe an event that is clearly described in the Bible. Our word rapture comes from the Latin word raptus, which means to take up or to carry off. The Apostle Paul writes this at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. There it is will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, Paul says, encourage one another with these words. And so, the first part of Christ's return will be when he comes for his own, meaning he will come to remove his church from this world. The purpose of this removal is to deliver believers from that seven-year period of suffering known as the tribulation. This period of suffering and of terror will be directed by Satan's agent of evil, the Antichrist. It is at the end of this seven-year period of tribulation that Christ will return for the second part of his two-part return. It is at this time that Christ, according to verse 20, 30, according to verse 30, will come in power and great glory. And the purpose of his second coming is to bring judgment upon all who are guilty of two things. Judgment will come upon those who arrogantly maintain their spirit of rebellion and therefore refuse the life-saving invitation of Christ to believe and to have forgiveness of sin, the forgiveness of sin that brings eternal life. While Christ's return will be a two-part event, in this section of the discourse, Christ's focus is on the second part of his return, that is, his coming in judgment. But although his focus is on the judgment, allow me to quickly say this. The principles that Jesus gives in regard to his coming in judgment also apply to his coming for the rapture of his church. That is because while the precise day and hour of his coming for the judgment at the end of the tribulation are unknown, it is even less clear when Christ will come to rapture his church. That is why all people should pay close attention to this series of parables that illustrate the sudden and unexpected nature of Christ's coming. In the passage we considered last week, Jesus compared his return to the unexpected arrival of a thief in the night. After that parable, 
Jesus drew a crucial conclusion. And this verse, I believe, is the most important verse in the Olivet Discourse. At Matthew 24, verse 44, Jesus says this, Therefore, be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Be ready, Jesus says. And all people everywhere ought to know, they need to know that there is only one way to be ready. It is to repent and believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. As we come to the next parable, Jesus continues to emphasize both the unexpected nature of his return and the crucial necessity of being ready. But in this parable, he adds a new element. Jesus will now make a comparison between those who are ready and those who are not ready. And how will Jesus make this comparison? The immediate answer is that those who have put their faith in him are ready, while those who have not put their faith in him are not ready. But as this parable will show, that faith or lack of faith will be made apparent in how people conduct themselves how people live their lives while Christ is away until his second coming. In this parable, we see a theme that appears in many of Christ's parables. And that image is of a master who is called away for an extended period of time, but makes clear he will come again. Obviously, these parables are meant to illustrate Jesus' own seeming absence during the period that we are now in, that period between his first and second comings. And I emphasize his seeming absence because the Christian knows that while Christ, while Christ is now at the Father's right hand, he is also present with us, and he lives in the heart of every believer. But for those who deny him, who live in an ongoing state of rebellion, well, they see Christ's absence as permanent, and therefore they see it as an opportunity to live as they wish. Let's look at the parable and we'll consider it in two parts. First, we'll consider the wise servant and then the rebellious servant. Let's look, please, at verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. Here Jesus is referring to believers. And when I say believers, I have a very specific meaning in mind. When I say believers, I don't mean those people who merely believe that a historical figure named Jesus was once part of this earth. Instead, when I refer to believers, I am referring to those who have submitted to Christ as Savior and Lord. I've said this before, and I will say it again, because this is a crucial point. It is not enough to believe that Jesus is Savior. 
we must also surrender to him as Lord. You see, we cannot have him as Savior if we are unwilling to have him as Lord. If we fear death, and it is natural to do so, if we fear death, it is easy to call upon him as Savior. But what is, but what is difficult and what demonstrates that we have genuinely called upon him as Savior is if we are willing to have him as Lord. To surrender to him as Lord means we acknowledge that he is the king, that he is on the throne and he alone is on the throne. We don't get to vote. We don't get to debate with the one who is on the throne. We don't get to say, Jesus, I like what you're saying in this, on this subject, and so I'll apply this teaching to my life, but I'm not sure I agree with you on this subject, and so I'm not sure I'm going to apply that to my life. No. If we want him as Savior, he must be our Lord. And if he is our Lord... If we can truly say, not just with our lips, but with our heart, that he is the king of kings, that he is the Lord of lords, that makes our role very clear. If he is Lord, our role is to obey him. Jesus said at John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Therefore, when Jesus asks at verse 45, who then is the faithful and wise servant? The answer is very clear. The faithful and wise servant is the servant who obeys, who does what the master commands. As the parable continues, Jesus now illustrates with a test. This test is to distinguish between those who truly love him and those who do not. Those who love him will live in obedience, while those who do not love him will live in rebellion. In the first part of the parable, we see that the master has commanded the servant to perform a task. While the master is away, this servant has been told to care for his fellow servants. One of those tasks is to give the household their food in due season, or as some translations have it, give them their food at the proper time. I will suggest that we can see this task as carrying symbolic meaning, a meaning which is to be applied in the life of every person. Think of this task in a broader perspective. The task that is assigned to the servant of giving food to his fellow servants represents the responsibility of caring for other people. And this responsibility of doing whatever task the master assigns to us is especially important in the life of every believer. Every believer who is a servant of Christ is assigned a task or tasks. And those tasks are assigned, uh, are assigned to us according to our gifts, according to our abilities that God has given us. As Paul says in Romans 12, if it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Therefore, the evidence of our faith is that we will obediently and consistently do the tasks that God has appointed to us. 
The Christian is not merely a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. Now comes a key point upon which the entire parable turns. Jesus describes a test that determines the true state of the servant's heart. And the results of this test will be determined when the master returns from being away. When the master comes again, he will determine whether or not the servant is found doing what the master commanded. Let's look, please, at verse 46. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. The corresponding truth illustrated by this verse is easy to discern. When Christ comes again, for those who are truly his, who have put their faith in him, they will be found doing what the master has commanded, and they will be blessed for doing so. Let's look, please, at verse 47. Jesus says this, Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. In other words, as a reward for the servant's faithfulness, the master will put the servant in charge of all that he owns. This verse represents an amazing promise, and so it's important that we not misunderstand it. At first glance, it might appear that this represents an added burden of responsibility. For example, if an employee does a good job at work, they may be given a promotion. That person may welcome that promotion and welcome the added salary that likely comes with it, but they're not keen about having that added responsibility, that added stress that usually comes with a promotion. To be sure, Christ is speaking here of added responsibility, but we need to be sure not to think in terms of these added tasks, these added responsibilities in worldly terms. Instead, we need to think in terms of God's eternal kingdom. You see, whatever we do, whatever we will do in Christ's eternal kingdom, that's a labor of love. And in that eternal kingdom, I can assure you, whatever God will have us do, that will be an extraordinary privilege. And the more we do to serve our Lord, the Lord who saved us to eternal life, <laughs> greater will be our everlasting joy. Let's turn our attention now to the second part of the parable. After giving an example of the faithful and wise servant, Jesus now paints a tragic picture of a servant who is wicked and rebellious. While the faithful servant consistently strives to obey what the master commanded, the wicked servant gives the appearance of obedience while the master is there but as soon as the master goes away, the servant reveals the true state of his heart, and that is rebellion. Let's go, please, to verse 48. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, and so you see, by his actions, this servant demonstrate that his devotion to his master is not genuine. He is not consistent in his effort to please the master. Here, the issue is not one of failure, because even the faithful servant will sometimes fail. Here, instead, the issue is one of willful disobedience. It is of outright rebellion. 
This wicked servant appears to be obedient when the master is near. But as soon as the master goes away, he reveals who he truly is. And apparently, the longer the master is away, the more emboldened this rebellious servant becomes. And I think we will recognize this kind of rebellion is not limited to the hypothetical world of parables. We see it played out every day in the world around us. Consider this. There are many people who will concede that there was an historical figure named Jesus. They may say, they might say, he was a great teacher. He was a man of astounding morals. Some people might even say, you know what? If other people around me lived more like this Jesus of Nazareth, the world would be a better place. But they will also go on to say, but to think of this Jesus as God come in the flesh, or that one day he is coming back to judge the living and the dead, at this they'll scoff and dismiss the idea of a coming judgment as absurd. And what is the result of this thinking? Those who do not believe that the master is coming back, they live in a state of rebellion. They live according to a selfish philosophy that says, I will do as I see fit. I will do whatever is right in my own eyes. And as a result, a world that denies the coming judgment grows increasingly violent and unstable. But despite the denials and the unbelief of the world, the Bible warns over and over that there is a day of judgment coming, that Jesus Christ, the living God, is coming again, and he is coming in judgment. And because that day grows closer with each and every passing moment. It is all the more urgent that everyone prepare for that day. We don't know if that day is today. We don't know if that day is a thousand years away. Nevertheless, Christ says, be ready. And there is only one way to prepare for the coming judgment. That is to repent and believe that Jesus Christ is both Savior and Lord. Tragically, many people have heard this call for repentance, but they have not responded. They've put it off, perhaps thinking, I'll get to it later. Well, these people would do well to remember that this life is fleeting and that there is no guarantee that any of us have another day. And of course, they must bear in mind the words of Christ at verse 50, where he says this, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These words of Christ will sound shocking to our ears and they are shocking because these words clearly describe the judgment and because they are shocking and because they do describe the judgment, many want to avoid Verses like these. But we cannot avoid them. Because anyone who avoids any teaching of Christ does so at their own peril. While the faithful servant was promised blessing, the rebellious servant is promised punishment. There are three images that are used to describe what awaits the wicked and rebellious servant. That is all who do not surrender to Christ as Savior and Lord. First, Jesus says, the master 
will cut him in two. Will unbelievers actually be cut in two when Christ comes in judgment? It's possible, but probably not. This is most likely figurative language. Jesus often uses shocking imagery to emphasize a crucial point as if to say, don't miss this. And what is his point? The unbeliever will receive the most severe and the most painful punishment that can possibly be imagined. Be ready, repent, and believe. The second image describes the master's assessment of the wicked servant. In the parable, Jesus goes on to say that the master will appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. We have seen this word hypocrite many times in our study of Matthew, but it's been a while since we considered it last, and so let's do a quick review. Our English word hypocrite is borrowed directly from the Greek language, and the Greek word hypocrates literally means stage actor. A hypocrite, therefore, is someone who puts on who who wears a mask to portray a character, but underneath is someone completely different. And so this wicked servant has two faces, one that he puts on while the master is around. But when the master is away, the mask comes off and the servant reveals who he actually is. And in this parable, The servant reveals that he is violent and selfish, who beats his fellow servants and participates in carnality rather than his responsibility. As we read through the Gospels, we see that Jesus is most heated when he is confronting those he identifies as hypocrites. For example, Jesus was especially livid when he was confronting the Pharisees because they were putting on a show of external righteousness for other people to see, but Jesus easily exposed them for what they were really were inside. And he most famously described the Pharisees as whitewashed tombs who looked good on the inside, but inside were full of death. And so the hypocrite, the death that is already in them, will last for all eternity. Repent and believe to be ready for the judgment. In the third and final image, Jesus describes the place that is appointed for all who refuse to surrender their lives to Christ. In this place, Jesus says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There is no doubt that Jesus here is referring to the horrors of hell. And this is the place that is reserved for those who refuse to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the master, that he alone is Lord. Listen. Whoever refuses to have Christ as Lord shows that they are in rebellion against the king. They are in effect saying, Jesus, I have no need of you because I will be my own Lord. But here's the truth of the matter. There is only one Lord and whoever has the wicked audacity to attempt to claim that they belong on the throne will be by the king banished to an everlasting exile. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so, knowing as we do the necessity and the crucial importance of being ready, let's ask a closing question. If we have put our faith in Christ and therefore we are ready, 
And we know that Christ will return and that that day draws nearer with every moment. How then should we live? How should we as Christians conduct ourselves? Well, let's have the Apostle Paul answer that question as we hear once again his words to Titus. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, in these difficult and uncertain times, we take comfort in knowing that there is certainty in you. You are eternal and your goodness never changes. Bless us and keep us, we pray, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.